Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to News 3 Now, live at 4 on this Thursday. A little more rain today, more, more rain. April showers. What we, well, it's May now. Well, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's May right. showers. May showers, yeah, that's right. But I think there's some light at the, yes. literal light at and the end. And it's good timing for the weekend yeah, as well. We'll get to the weather in just a minute. But first, topping the news today, Governor Evers says he is not backing down on plans to expand Medicaid, while Republican lawmakers say his plan won't work. ICE agents plan to start a new DNA testing program at the U.S.-Mexico border, but that move is raising some privacy concerns. And flags are at half-staff today to honor a Middleton police officer who died from brain cancer. We'll take a look at how her community is remembering her. Let's take a look outside today. As we were saying, cloudy skies on this, this Thursday. All too familiar scene around here the last few days. But we're taking baby steps toward warmer temperatures. Dana Fulton is in the backyard with some good news for a change. Yeah, yeah, we are taking those slow, steady baby steps in a good direction. Uh, by tomorrow, we are expecting our temperatures to be just a little closer than average or a little closer to average. And then by Saturday, I think should be pretty decent outside. This is a live looking Platteville with our Queen Bee Radio Sky Camp. Unfortunately, that cloud deck just didn't give it all today. And that's why our temperatures stayed just a little cooler. It looks like it's really going to stay mostly cloudy for us uh, throughout the overnight. We we'll won't start to see a bit of a break until Again, by the time we get into the weekend, things will improve just a little bit. But that cloud deck holding on pretty steady. We have had a few drizzle spots through the morning and early afternoon. Right now we're seeing a little more rain towards Milwaukee. Not rolling out the slight chance, though, for a shower through the rest of the evening. But it will just be some light shower chances. Nothing significant rolling through. Uh, looking at our visible cloud track, you can see all that cloud coverage. We saw some breaks just to the western edge of Iowa. Unfortunately, those breaks, again, just a little too far to the west. To, to really build on it in for us. It's 51 currently in Madison, so we've climbed up just a little bit, about 50 towards Rockford. So everybody, again, setting in that similar boat. There's no big temperature gradients or, or big front sliding through. It is a little warmer on the western edge of the state as opposed to that southeast corner. They're seeing some cooler air still in, in place, especially compared to 24 hours ago. Light breeze for us overnight. It'll stay pretty calm. We aren't expecting breezy conditions. We're just expecting that cool air through the rest of the evening. Temperatures will be in the mid-40s by 10, and we will fall close to 40 yet again by your Friday morning. We'll take a closer look at what's ahead for Friday and Saturday and Sunday in just a few minutes. Right now on the roads, I do want to draw attention to the Beltline right at 51. We actually have three incidents there. They're all blocking the shoulders. No lanes of traffic are actually blocked, uh, but the Beltline eastbound seeing a delay heading up to 51. And then, of course, on Stoughton Road, we are seeing that delay heading uh, southbound, actually. In that direction. The Beltline eastbound heading up towards John Nolan also seen delays right now. The westbound side doesn't seem too bad around Verona. Traffic should be fairly smooth. Same goes near Mount Horeb and around Janesville. We aren't seeing any major hiccups right now. Downtown just a few more brake lights as more people get on the roads. 31 minutes from Janesville to the Beltline. The big delay there, of course, as you get closer to the Beltline, uh, that, that's where we're seeing the slowdown. 17 minutes from Sauk City to Middleton and 15 minutes from Sun Prairie to downtown. That should be a quick little buzz for you this evening. It's cloudy outside. It's a little cool but you shouldn't have any rain concerns again as you're hopping on the roads. The birds are liking it. The birds are tweeting away. They're yeah, happy. They're happy. All right. So are we. Thanks, Dana. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dana. First at four, as Governor Evers pushes for Medicaid expansion, he's being met with resistance from GOP leaders. Today, Assembly Speaker Robin Voss is accusing the governor of empty rhetoric. But as Roe Schmidt explains, Evers is not backing down. Yes, well, Republicans who control the state's budget committee say they plan to remove more than 70 items from Governor Evers' budget proposal next week, including Medicaid expansion. The governor reacted to that at a news conference in Milwaukee today, saying he's not giving up. His budget proposal is built around accepting that federal money, freeing up $1.6 billion from other health care spending. Some Republicans have said they would be open to compromise, but Republican Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, who has long opposed Medicaid expansion, says Evers isn't telling the full story of what that expansion could bring. Voss says it will shift more costs to taxpayers as about 40,000 people would have to give up their private insurance in order to get on Badger Care. So I'm here today with a message for the people of Wisconsin. I'm going to fight like hell for Medicaid expansion. I need your help to get it done. I need you to call your legislators. Those of us who control the legislature ran saying we do not want to expand welfare in Wisconsin. So ultimately it takes two to tango and we are not going to give in just because Tony Evers continues to use misleading rhetoric about what the impact would be on the insurance market. Evers cited public opinion overwhelmingly in favor of Medicaid expansion. The Marquette Law School poll last month showed 
70% of voters polled are in favor. But Voss says his job as an elected official is to take all of the information and make the best decision for the state. The Joint Committee on Finance plans to meet next Thursday at 11 a.m., where the Republican co-chairs say they will remove Evers' priorities in a single vote. 70, 70 or so policy items there. We'll continue to follow it. Thanks, Rose. Uh, and Republicans, uh, Republican Assembly Speaker Robin Voss says he hopes to find a middle ground with Governor Evers on the limited legalization of medical marijuana. Today, he said Republicans won't go along with Evers' expansive proposal that also includes decriminalizing small amounts of recreational marijuana. Speaker Voss has long supported a limited legalization for chronic medical conditions. And today, Governor Evers met with Foxconn CEO Terry Goh for the first time. They met at Mitchell Airport in Milwaukee, along with Mark Hogan. He's the head of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Ahead of the meeting, Evers told the Journal Sentinel that he plans to talk with Go about making sure that he's successful in Wisconsin. The governor also said he planned to emphasize that he wanted to make sure there are adequate protections for taxpayers and environmental standards. Their meeting comes a day after Go met with President Trump at the White House. In a statement today, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said Foxconn will soon announce more investments in Wisconsin. On Capitol Hill, Attorney General William Barr did not show up to today's House Judiciary Committee hearing. Barr was scheduled to testify about his handling of special counsel Robert Mueller's report, but he backed out when Democrats added an extra hour of questioning by staff attorneys. The Justice Department called that request for lawyers inappropriate and unnecessary. Tensions between the DOJ and Democrats escalated when Speaker Nancy Pelosi accused the Attorney General of lying before a Senate panel yesterday. As the Attorney General of the United States of America was not telling the truth to the Congress of the United States. That's a crime. The department responded, calling the attack baseless and false. So far, the DOJ has not complied with a subpoena to turn over the full, unredacted Mueller report. Just into the Channel 3000 Alert Center, Baltimore Mayor Kath uh, Catherine Pugh is stepping down from her position effective immediately. She is resigning amid a growing scandal about her self-published children's book series. Last month, Pugh's office announced she was taking a leave of absence, citing a battle with pneumonia. The announcement came the same day Maryland's governor requested an investigation into the sales of her book, Healthy Holly. ICE officers will start a DNA testing program at the southern border as early as next week. The pilot program will involve a voluntary cheek swab with results expected in less than two hours. The Department of Homeland Security says the unprecedented program will target human traffickers who are smuggling and exploiting children. Also trying to identify those families that are presenting as a parent or guardian that are, that are not uh, actually parent or guardian and the fraud issue uh, that's intrinsic there. The government claims the DNA samples will be destroyed after tests are run, but the ACLU calls the plan coercive and says it raises serious privacy and civil liberties concerns. The ACLU calls the program another attempt to deter asylum seekers. Back here in Wisconsin, Attorney General Josh Call is thanking everyone who participated in the drug take-back day over the weekend. He says preliminary collection totals are at more than 58,000 pounds of unused and unwanted medications. 278 law enforcement agencies hosted events to safely dispose of those prescriptions. They're on their way to a facility in Indianapolis to be incinerated so they don't get into the wrong hands. To find a safe place to dispose of medication all year long, go to doseofrealitywi.gov. A new partnership is ensuring food access on Madison's south side. There have been concerns about creating a food desert under a plan to demolish the pick and save there and build a new SSM health clinic. Mayor Sacha Rhodes Conway said in a statement that she and SSM Health will work together to build a full service grocery store on a nearby lot. The city will soon issue a new request for proposals. In honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day, First United Methodist Church in Baraboo is hosting a free educational program about the role music played in concentration camps and ghettos. UW-Madison researcher Dr. Terrell Dobbs will share the stories of children who represented their trauma through music. That program is at 6.30 tonight. Beforehand, Baraboo residents are encouraged to observe the annual Remembrance Day by planting Reject Hate, Unite in Love signs in their yard. 
The city of Middleton pays its respects to an officer who lost her battle with cancer. A funeral procession was held today for the late Katie Barrios, who died last week. Eric Franke joins us now with more on this story. Eric? Yeah, Mark and Susan, the governor, ordering flags to be flown at half staff today in honor of Officer Barrios, who lost her two and a half year battle to an aggressive form of brain cancer last week. A procession this morning at 11 closed down some of the streets in Middleton on the day of her memorial service. Barrios was a veteran officer of several departments, including Mount Horeb, the Iowa County Sheriff's Department, and also a department in Pennsylvania. Her Middleton colleagues thinking of her family as they said their final goodbyes young kids and um, uh, you know that's just tragic um, uh, to think about about what they went through the last two and a half years and and what her husband went through the last two and a half years and I think that's what tugs at all of us is um, the family that she leaves behind. Officer Barrios, a native of Cassville, graduated from Cassville High School back in 1993, as well as Madison College. Katie survived by her husband, Joe, an adult son and teenage daughter, and also two younger children as well. Now, the governor's order, it was effective this morning at sunri sunrise, and that will end at sunset this evening. Mark and Susan. Very sad day. Yes, it is. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Well, next to four, Google is responding to recent security concerns with a new fix to forget the data it collects. We'll take a look at plans for the new auto delete function. That's when News 3 Now Live at 4 continues.
Welcome back. Burger King is taking a swipe at McDonald's, releasing its own not-so-happy meals. The fast food chain is advertising real meals, an adult-sized Whopper meal that doesn't come with a toy. You can order based on how you're feeling. For example, there is the salty meal, there is the blue meal. The move is in honor of Mental Health Month in collaboration with the nonprofit Mental Health America. And the slogan on the box is supposed to remind customers that no one is happy all of the time. Interesting. And Google wants to make it easier for people to delete their personal data. The company announced it's adding auto delete tools for location history data as well as web browsing and app activity. The user will be able to select how long they want their activity data to be saved for. Then the information will be removed after that amount of time. The features will be available in the coming weeks. Stocks fell today, a day after the Federal Reserve decided not to lower <coughs> interest rates. The Dow Industrials lost 122 points, closing at 26,307. The NASDAQ Composite Index gave up 12, and the S&P 500 fell 6. It is Friday Eve, almost the weekend in the 608. And Emmy Fink is here with a look at what's going on around town this weekend. You didn't bring my buddy today? I didn't. How's Although he doing? I, he he uh, gave you a special call out with a nice <laughs> little spit up right before I left that Aww. just missed my white pants. We're talking oh. about her new baby. Her baby. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should explain that. Yeah. Well, All right. good to see you. A fun weekend good to ahead. See you guys. Gallery night is tomorrow night. Yeah, and, and good thing it's not tonight with. <laughs> It's a little bit yeah. of rain. But yes, tomorrow night, a great night. Gallery night goes on from 5 to 9 at various locations downtown. So basically, the city becomes this citywide art exhibit and performance space. It's awesome. Art displays, art making, demos, and live music at 72 venues. Wow. That's a lot of venues. Museums, restaurants, and different businesses. And there's a handy map right on the Gallery Night website that will guide you to everywhere you need to go. There's downtown venues, Willie Street, East Wash, Atwood Avenue, Winnebago, North Side, UW campus, and then of course one of my favorites, Monroe and Regent Streets as well. So. Sounds like the whole city. Exactly. <laughs> 72 locations That's is a lot. A lot. Yeah, so impressive. use that map. It'll, it'll be helpful. All right, time to laugh. I, I need a good laugh. You guys need a good laugh. <laughs> we all funny, need a good laugh. Funny man Dane Cook brings his Tell It Like It Is tour to the Orpheum Theater, his first major tour in six years. So the comic star of stage and screen, you've seen him in Employee of the Month, Mr. Brooks, and My Best Friend's Girl, which reminds me of the car song. My best friend's girl. You just got to sing, don't you? I know. It's, it's my favorite. Well, he's been a stand-up comedian since 1990 and has recorded six comedy albums. Friday night at the Orpheum is where you can see him. And he's cute. Uh, he's there funny. You go. Very yeah. fun. Another bonus. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, something fun for the whole family this weekend. Two great events coming up for the whole family, exactly. So imagine, how good does this sound? Imagine a land of chocolate rivers. Sounds Dark good. chocolate rivers would be you know, basically have another. <laughs> <laughs> you can expect that this weekend at Overture Center's Roal Dolls Willy Wonka production. Saturday shows are at 2.30 and 7, Sunday at 2.30, and then going on next weekend as well. Enter a world of pure imagination with CTM's Madison production of Willy Wonka. Oompa Loompas and everything you can imagine when Charlie presents his golden ticket. Fun for the whole family, as they say. You got it. And there's another popular event um, based off a popular movie. I'd like to say that I've seen Star Wars. I really do. You've never seen I, Star Wars? I know I need to. I know I need to. None of them. None of them. Oh, None of them. Wow. But how perfect that May 4th does land on a Saturday and the Children's Museum can celebrate the Star Wars themed holiday, May the 4th be with you. So grab the kids, lightsabers, masks, capes, and head for the museum. They're having a museum wide event. You can join in meeting R2D2, joining in the Empire vs. Rebel scavenger hunt, and there's even a Lego Star Wars exhibit by the professionals, the Wisconsin Lego Users Group. That's Saturday from 10 to 4 30. Well, now that you have not... a little boy, you'll know all about lightsabers in just a little while. Oh, boy, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, I'm going to have to watch it now. <laughs> there's a couple of music options this weekend. Yeah, so just some quick hitters. So tonight at 8 30 at the High New Saloon, you can see a folk rock songwriter. His name is Timothy Showalter. He performs as Strand of Oaks. He has faced his share of bad luck. luck. His marriage has ended. His house has burned down. He's been homeless. But since then, he's bounced back. He has actually recorded seven albums. An oh, incredible inspiring. story there. Mm -hmm. Makes you want to go see him, right? The Madison Symphony Orchestra performs Symphony of a Thousand at Overture Hall. Three shows this weekend. There's going to be more than 400 musicians combined because there are three choirs that they're bringing in. 400 people all on that stage 
during the course of the show. Should be quite a show. That's a lot. I heard they had to rehearse on the loading dock. It was the only area big enough to hold everybody. Is that your joke for the day, or no, is that true? No, it's true. It's true. All right. Well, I'm still going to laugh. That's not, much of, that's not much of a joke. <laughs> well, I could do better than that. I don't. Kind of a joke. I'm going to laugh at anything these days. It's just fun to be out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's a little sleep deprived. <laughs> a tad bit. All right. <laughs> Look at it's going to be good to see you. Get this good month's Madison Magazine for all the best in the Madison area. And we'll be right back. You're watching News 3 Now, live at 4. Take a look at this. Police say more than 120 tires were stolen from this Louisiana car dealership, leaving dozens of brand new cars up on blocks. Suspects pulled the truck into the Chevy dealership in the middle of the night. They then removed and made off with $120,000 worth of rims and tires. Police say the thieves avoided security cameras, locks and alarms. They even shut off the parking lot lights to pull the heist off in the dark. The dealership is offering a $25,000 reward for information on the suspects. Well, they didn't completely avoid the security cameras. <laughs> yeah, there's something. <laughs> so, the, but that, you know, come to work the Wow. Yeah. Wild. Well, we are still more than a year away from the Democratic National Convention. But there are already some changes in the works to make sure visitors have enough time to partake in their favorite adult beverages. Bar times might be pushed back to 4 a.m just for the convention. The Wisconsin Restaurant Association is floating the idea since the convention visitors will be busy until late into the evening. 
but making that change happen is actually going to be difficult. It would require a change in state law and in licensing or permits in communities where bar hours would be extended. The Restaurant Association says it'll be worth it to make sure people can experience more of what the city has to offer. That's a good idea to have people with a hangover selecting your next president. <laughs> <laughs> Today, Yelp will start showing health scores for restaurants in Dane County and 59 other counties in the state. The company is partnering with HD Scores, which will provide a 0 to 100 score based on public data from local health departments. If the local health department doesn't provide the data, HD Scores will calculate one based on past inspection results. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. good tool. I like it. All right. Very cool. How about the health of our weather? Uh, it's it's getting there. Baby steps, right? <laughs> little, little, slowly but surely baby steps. Uh, we are expecting temperatures tomorrow to just hop up a few more degrees, and then we finally get the sunshine uh, by Saturday. So a closer look at what's ahead for the next few days right after the break. It was a little cloudy and rainy outside today. As much as I like spending my time outside with Penny, I decided to go hang out with actually the kindergartners at Chavez Elementary and talk a little bit about what it's like to be a meteorologist. And of course, the forecast that we have here in southern Wisconsin. These kids were fantastic. They had a lot of really good questions uh, about uh, what I do every single day. And they also already knew what the difference was between a watch and a warning and where their safe places were. So I had a great time, a lot of great questions. We also got to read, of course, a Peppa Pig book. So I was very excited with the kindergarten crew. And if you are interested in scheduling any sort of school visit with our, our weather team, you can just shoot us an email, weather 
Taylor at WISCTV.com. You can email myself or always message through Facebook or Twitter. Lots of options. Uh, we have lots of time to go hang out with the students, and uh, there's probably a mini meteorologist there in that bunch somewhere. We have cloud coverage throughout the state right now. We were hoping for a little bit of sunshine just along the western edge, but notice uh, most of that clearing is really happening off to the western side of Iowa. Nothing really coming through for us. A few rain chances have popped on up. Not some big, strong storms, but some drizzle spots. Most of it to the eastern edge of the state, close to Milwaukee. But uh, don't be surprised if you do feel a few raindrops falling through the rest of this evening. Again, not enough that you would need an umbrella, but enough where you walk outside and just say, man, uh, this little pressure is sliding right on overhead. It's still taking its little time. That line, of course, is a trough just stretching through those two centers of low pressure. As it moves east, the rain chances and the cloud coverage slide away along with it. We have high pressure off in the plains. That'll steadily build on in and will give us sunshine by Saturday. So we are going to stay cloudy overnight. By Friday, plan on a pretty overcast sky in the afternoon. We may see a few pockets of sun early, uh, but our chances are actually decreasing to have a nice sunny sky on Friday. So mostly cloudy with a slight chance for a shower later in the day. Saturday Saturday, we finally get actual sunshine, a mostly sunny sky uh, by Saturday afternoon. And then for Sunday, we are going to have another chance for rain come on in for us starting to develop in the afternoon. May see an isolated thunderstorm in there also. So the first half of your weekend really doesn't look too bad for Saturday. Overnight low temperatures will fall close to 40, so we'll spend the rest of the afternoon uh, sliding close to 50 and then into the upper 40s. Early tomorrow morning, we're near 40 degrees. Again, a few pockets of sunshine possible early in the day, uh, but likely not going to see very much. A slight chance for showers in the afternoon. Temperatures will be a little closer to average. Baby steps in the right direction. Close to 60 for afternoon highs on Friday. Saturday, we start off the day with a, a seasonal start close to 40 early in the morning. A clear sky expected for much of the day. A few clouds possible, but overall really not too bad for us on Saturday. And high temps will be in the mid to upper 60s. So it'll be a little above average for Saturday. Now, now Sunday, we also are expecting mid to upper 60s. It's just going to come along with that rain chance, unfortunately. Unfortunately, overnight low of about 40 with a light breeze coming from the north. Not going to see any strong wind gusts. Won't be too windy outside early in the day, but it is going to stay mostly cloudy. And we do have the chance for some areas of fog to, to develop later on tonight and for early, early Friday. The concern there are dew points actually very close to our temperatures. When they get too close, that's when we have our fog develop. Tomorrow, we're looking at a high of 60 degrees for your Friday. Our breeze will be coming from the northeast at about 5 to 10 miles per hour, which isn't too bad. Cloudy, but not quite as cool. And again, there is that slight chance for a shower to pop up in the afternoon or early evening. Looking through the weekend, temperatures actually won't be too bad. It's just going to be a little rainy outside by Sunday. So if you do get out at all for Friday, again, probably won't need the jacket in the afternoon. Close to 60 with a slight chance for a shower. Saturday, we have some sun in the upper 60s. Sunday, we do have that chance for some rain later in the day, otherwise a partly sunny sky. Heading into next week, our unsettled weather pattern is going to stick with us through the beginning and middle of the week, but temperatures are not going to drop nearly as much as where we've been at for this week. So we'll finally start to hop on up a little bit. We'll feel a little more like spring rather than like the end of March outside. Yeah, I, I have to tell myself it's May. It's May. It promises. It's May. <laughs> it feels like April. Yeah, yeah. It, it really does. Yeah. It's just a little too cool. But uh, again, the the rain that just keeps coming in for us, we are going to be keeping a close eye on those rivers and yeah. streams yeah. heading through the rest of the week. Absolutely. All right, All right Dana. Right. Thank, Thank you, you mm -hmm. Dana. There is feverish speculation <laughs> across Britain about when Meghan Markle will give birth to the country's newest royal baby. She is due any time now. CBS's Ian Lee is in Prince Harry and Meghan's hometown of Windsor, England. The countdown is on at Windsor Hooray! Castle. Hooray! A royal baby is on the way. I think we're all excited about the royal baby. Um, once we know that it's here and it's safe. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have played it low key. So while all eyes are on their medieval residence, no one knows when or even where the tiny royal will be born. I'm hoping it happens in the next few days because we're only going to be here until Saturday. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex are ditching decades of royal tradition choosing not to pose for photos right away. Prince Harry's mother, the late Princess Diana, started the practice of presenting royal babies to the public soon after their birth. I've been to them all. I've been to Prince George, Prince Charlotte, Prince Louis. Royal fan John Laughley says the birth of Prince Harry and Meghan's child is extra special because of mom's American influence. And I see you're decked out in the Union Jack. Are you going to put a little stars and stripes in there, a little America? Well, how about that, then? Oh, you got a little America right there. Yeah, got... Well, not everyone has royal fever. Honestly, couldn't care less. 
The most fervent royal fans are glued to Prince Harry and Meghan's Instagram account, where it's widely expected they'll reveal the news about their first child. Ian Lee, CBS News, Windsor, England. And some royal fans are convinced the royal baby has already arrived, but despite the rumors, a palace source tells, tells CBS News, as of this morning, the baby has not yet been born. All right, stay tuned, stay as tuned. we say. Still to come tonight at 4, there is a new tool to help reduce thoughts of suicide. Using an MRI machine, doctors can determine if a person is suicidal. More on this groundbreaking research when Live at 4 continues. A live look at downtown Madison. This could have been Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, Wednesday, we're on autopilot, Thursday. aren't we? Yeah, a little stuck. But it's improving tomorrow, I guess. Advances in technology are changing the way we understand brain activity and diagnosing potentially deadly mental health disorders. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death in the United States, according to the Centers for Disease Control. As part of Mental Health Awareness Month, Nikki Batiste shows us how researchers are using brain scans to spot harmful thoughts. There were certain concepts that were altered in people who thought about suicide. And our method was able to detect those differences. That method begins with a sophisticated piece of equipment, a functional MRI. With fMRI, you see a picture of the brain's activities. So you're saying every thought idea in our brain has its own specific pattern? Yes. And what's really, I think, fascinating and relatively new 
is the patterns are similar across people. Unless you have suicidal thoughts, then they're altered. That's what psychiatric illnesses do. They change the way you think. And this method can, I think, identify those changes. These images show two people thinking about the word death. This one has thought about suicide. This one has not. The colors represent brain neurons. Red is telling you. That you get here. activation related to self-thinking when they're thinking about death. But among people who have made an attempt, you see even more of this dark red. 34 people took part in his latest study. 17 of them never had suicidal thoughts, but the other 17 had. And over half of those 17 had even attempted suicide in the past. These second-by-second -second snapshots show clear differences in the brain patterns when the participants were asked to think about different concepts like carefree, praise, and death. Those snapshots were then analyzed by this complex computer server, storing hundreds of thoughts by hundreds of people. We can tell whether somebody's feeling anger or happiness or sadness. We can tell what number a person's thinking. Dr. Just's method was 90% accurate in determining who had past suicidal thoughts and attempts. Dr. Joshua Gordon, director of the National Institute of Mental Health, thinks Dr. Just's work could lead to more effective treatment. If we could understand the neurobiology underlying the drive to harm oneself, then we would be able to design better therapies. In the future, Dr. Just hopes to apply his approach to other psychiatric disorders like depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. Nikki Batiste, CBS News, New York. The National Institute of Mental Health recently awarded Dr. Just and his team a $3.8 million grant to continue their research. And coming up on Live at 4, UW Health researchers say they're testing out an impressive new treatment for brain cancer. They say it can double the life expectancy for some patients. We'll talk with the doctor about the groundbreaking technology and learn about a special conference coming up for patients when we come back.
We have delays heading down to Verona. We have delays along the Beltline, and we have delays along 90 right now. Uh, this is a look at the Beltline at Fish Hatchery Road, both east and westbound, uh, quite congested. And this area here, right along the Beltline in 51, that's where we actually have a few different accidents that are blocking shoulders, but they're just causing delays, of course, on that eastbound side as you're heading closer to Stoughton. Overall, the eastbound side seeing the most delays, but we are seeing a little bit of a hiccup here near Fish Hatch on the westbound side, and things pick up a little more once you get past Verona Road and then Verona towards McKee, seeing quite a few delays there as well. Mount Horeb, uh, not too bad downtown, but 151, we are seeing a few stop and go spots around Verona. Things look okay. Again, once you get past McKee Road and then around the Janesville area, uh, no major delays, 39 to 90 smooths out there as you head down towards the state line. From Janesville to the Beltline, we'll take you 27 minutes, Sox City to Middleton, about 18, and some Prairie to downtown. We've added just a few minutes onto that commute. We'll also take you about 18 minutes. That's a quick look at your first alert traffic. All right, Dana, thank you. This weekend, there's an opportunity for brain tumor patients of all ages, their family members and friends, to have some of their questions answered. UW Health is hosting that event. Their providers serve more than 1,200 brain tumor patients each year. And joining us tonight to talk more about the event and some groundbreaking new research that is increasing the life expectancy for brain cancer patients are Dr. Ian Robbins and nurse specialist Lori Hayes from UW Health. Thank and you both and, for and being here. And a special here. friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Dr. for being with us. Dr. Robbins, tell us about this brown, groundbreaking new technology. So what is it, this? It was discovered that if you can set up an alternating electrical field and the signal strength is between uh, ultrasound and microwave, that you can disrupt cancer cells uh, as they begin to divide. And this technology is now FDA approved in both newly diagnosed and recurrent glioblastoma. The same technology now is being developed and tested for a variety of other cancers, uh, including lung cancer. There's a clinical trial that's just opened up at the university. Uh, one, another trial will open up very shortly for pancreatic cancer and potentially brain metastases. There's a clinical trial nationally for ovarian cancer. Is this a potential cure or just extend life? Uh, there are a minority of patients who are, whose possibility of getting out beyond five years is doubled or tripled with this device, but that's a, a small number. But the majority of patients uh, in different subsets will have a marked increase in survival measuring more than a, a year. Lori, this is something that patients are going to want to hear about. Yes, well, we're, we're fortunate that we can offer this to our patients. So tell us a little bit about the conference and the topics you're going to be talking about. Well, we started in 2008 with our first conference, and this is our first year of hosting a pediatric and adult conference together. And so we have someone who's going to be talking about CBD oil, and is it a magical medicine or a mythical or misguided myth? Mm -hmm. And we have someone who'll be talking about to patients who have vestibular dysfunction, so they have facial nerve paralysis and treatments that can be offered for that. The pediatric journey is a little bit different. They're talking a little bit about diagnosis through survival because that's such a different trajectory, a trajectory than adult patients may have. It takes such fear out of it, I would think, yes. to know that you're not alone on this journey, just to meet other families that are going through the same experience. That's one of the things they love the most, is that opportunity to, to network. 1,200 patients a year at UW? Uh, is that what I, we said? Yes, yes, yeah. between benign or mm -hmm. non-cancerous and cancer patients. Dr. That, Robbins, are we seeing an increase in... There, ha there has been a, an increase uh, over the years. We actually don't know why. I think the, the incidence in the United States in adults is about 16,000 uh, patients a year. Uh, I think when I started out in neuro-oncology, it was closer to 10 or 11,000. And how do, you, how do you diagnose? How does someone get to you? So typically there are neurological symptoms followed up with an MRI and the MRI is usually diagnostic and uh, typically we start out with surgery followed by chemotherapy and radiation and now this is a very val valuable adjunct to what was standard therapy in the past. What does this involve for a patient? It, it is a commitment. There are no side effects except for skin irritation. And in fact, Lori has kind of pioneered um, techniques for uh, eliminating that. But basically, these arrays are placed in a strategic place based upon the patient's MRI. It's mapped. 
and the patient has to maintain these arrays in an electrical current, either wall current or a battery pack, pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. And with slight interruptions for showers or periodic MRIs. And the longer the current is going, the more efficacious the uh, therapy is. And this is covered by insurance? It is. So you keep that on, all, you keep the electrodes on all the time? Yes. Correct. Once the arrays are replaced, they're on 24 7 and, and they're changed every three days. It's fascinating, isn't it's it? It's a, a huge commitment for the family as well because the patient's not able to apply the arrays themselves. But if it buys you more time and a significant amount of time in yes. some cases, then it, it might be a sacrifice worth making. Yes. In our experience, every patient who started this uh, followed through. We've never ha actually had a patient quit once they've made the commitment to do mm -hmm. it. When you started out practicing, would you ever imagine there'd be something like this? No, and in fact, when I first heard about this, I considered it to be witchcraft. Uh, uh, it wasn't until some data started pouring in that I became convinced that this was a, a useful uh, therapy for the treatment of brain tumors. Wow, it's pretty amazing. And it, advancements continue all the time. Uh, absolutely, and it, uh, there are great advancements being made in uh, other forms of cancer therapy. Well, keep up the incredible work that you, you both do, and thank you for coming thank today. You. Thank you. for having us. Uh, let's tell folks about the uh, seminar specifics. Here we go. It is this Saturday, registration 8 a.m. Program is at 8.30 to 12.45 at the University Hospital Health Learning Center. That's at Highland Avenue, at, in the main hospital, UW Hospital. Yeah. Or is there any cost involved? No, there is not. And can you just show up, or do you need to pre-register? At this point, you can just show up. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that couldn't be room. easier. <laughs> Should be a, a, a great afternoon, a great morning. Thanks for being with Thanks us. Thanks, Thank you. Great sharing, to see you. Sharing this information. <laughs> we'll be right back with a final check of your forecast. Clouds? Clouds. Rain? <laughs> a few clouds, a few raindrops. Uh, we're in the, we're used to it at this point, That's so right. there's no reason to switch it up. <laughs> we're expecting a cloudy sky this evening. Look at our droplet track. There's some rain over towards Milwaukee, and we do have the chance to maybe see another little isolated shower spot pop on up, uh, but we're not really expecting much rain to come on through. Most of it's all off to the east right now. Here's our visible cloud track. As you can see, there haven't been any breaks, and uh, we're seeing some breakage on the western side of Iowa. That's where temperatures are in the low 60s towards Des Moines, but we're still in the low 50s in Madison and we'll be falling uh, through the 50s and 40s overnight, landing at about 
40 early tomorrow morning. As far as the next few hours are concerned, uh, it's going to be cloudy. Again, you may feel a raindrop or two, but no significant showers will be coming through for us. We'll be in the 40s for much of evening. So enough that you need the light jacket, but you don't need to bundle all up for okay. tonight at all. All right. Thank you, Dana. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dana. Coming up tomorrow here on Live Before, Michael Bruno goes backstage at the Abundant Life Christian School's production of The Wizard of Oz. And our canine correspondents, Lola and Louie, have the top animal stories of the week in the News Hounds Now update. That's tomorrow on Live at Four.